Today's guest interview is with Ralph Hilton. He is very well known in the independent field. He audits people for a living over in the mountains of Austria. He is an ex-Sea Org, and he used to be on the ship in the 70s. And he's done the OT levels. Welcome to the podcast, Ralph. Are you there? I'm here. Thanks, yeah. Andy. Uh, good, good. Good to hear from you. Um, what are you up to these days? Well, I'm auditing, mostly on Skype at the moment. I've been... Uh, Developing some e-meters. I'm uh, making them for people here. Wow. Uh, I you play see, with wow. quadcopters a bit. That's cool. You, you're making your own e-meter, huh? Yeah. Yeah? That's, um, uh, well, um, yeah, you can see them here. It's, uh, this is one I made that I use for a solo. Oh, wow. Look at that. Look how big. The, is that, a, is that a usually the dial usually that big, the range? It looks really long. Uh, no. No, this is a. Uh, this one's fifty percent bigger than the normal ones, and uh, it's an experimental one. I I just use it for solo because the the needle movement is quite different, so it takes a while to get used to. Normally, I I make them for people with the standard size, um, sort of uh, seven centimeter needle. So Where so this one? so would you recommend that people have two e meters, one sort of for the other stuff and one for the solo? Uh, no, I would just use the same one, actually. Uh, I, I like this one because of the wide, the wide dial. Um, but it's, it does take a little bit of learning to get used to if one's used to a normal one. It's, so uh, I can generally sell them. Mm. It's, it's, um, is it, does it have pretty much the same features as a Mark 7? Uh, no, it's... Uh, well, I can make them similar, but I prefer the automatic meters where the person doesn't have to touch the TA knob. It just brings the needle to set by itself. Wow. So, and, so, uh, so, it must be, so is it a lot easier to audit with these automatic TAs? Yeah, it's basically no touch. Once you've got the sensitivity set, then you don't need to do anything. Maybe touch the reset button occasionally to bring the needle back on the dial, but otherwise it's all automatic. Wow, and and it's actually accurate, so it's not like it. You can actually trust that this automatic TA works and everything. Oh yeah, yeah it's all. It's got a little computer in there that does all the calculations. Wow, do you reckon LIH would be uh, loving that? Um, I don't know. He was very. He wanted to keep it the same as it was in 1966 or 65 when he made the Mark V. He said, "Just keep it this way." Yeah. Because uh, he was worried about electronics guys changing things too much and getting too sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, so he liked his old Mark V and he wouldn't have had nothing to do with a quantum or a new Mark VIII or anything else. He would have just kept his old Mark V. Wow. Yeah. I don't, uh, uh, David Miscarriage would disagree with you on that one. Apparently, he LIH ordered to make the special quantum Mark VIII. Um, somehow I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah, so he, you would you be you would be saying David Miscavige would be lying, would you? <laughs> um, well, let's say creative in his. Uh, <laughs> I, I I think it's basically not true. I don't think. Well, the Mark Seven even didn't come out until after L O H was gone off the lines. Mm. And um, if L O H had really wanted a Mark Eight, it wouldn't have taken that many years for it to come out. Yeah. He would have just got it done within six months or so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what what does the church think of you? Like, um, are you a, a big SP? Oh, I'm on the official enemies list. Oh. <laughs> From thirty years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> declared a suppressive person. Shoot on sight. R two forty five and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all right. Well, ho hopefully, I don't get into too much trouble. Hard huh, talking to you. Oh, well, they'll, they'll blacklist you. They'll put up a website saying what a nasty person you are. And uh, but actually, I've had very little harassment from them here. It's, um, it's, is it dying away, or did, did you actually used to get a lot of attacks in the past? Or? Um, it's, they've sent a couple of people around. Oh, there was one girl that came, and she pretended to be interested, and she was asking questions. And... Then uh, a few weeks later, I got a call from the tax people 
and uh, they said, oh, you've been not listing this on with tax returns or whatever. And um, then I, I saw the, the paper they had in front of her, in front of the uh, tax guy, and they could see it was a, a handwriting and that. But there were things that she said in the letter that made it obvious it was someone from the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like the the language, like using words like reality and communication or something like that, or? Well, no, it was a particular thing they did, but it's something I don't want to say in case they do it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but basically, the uh, after I talked to the tax man and told him about the difficulties, he, he says, well, you better be careful. Someone doesn't like you. Yeah, they were just doing their job. <laughs> uh, letters like that, but, but there was that one episode, and then I mean, they've put things up on the internet. The um, hate websites or something? Um, no, well, one, but that's fairly minor. They, I got, uh, they wrote a program that all the uh, church computer users had to install on their computers. And one of the things that it did was it blocked my name from appearing on their computer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, I mean, this was, this was 20 years ago. It yeah. was after, it was just before Windows 98 came out. Yeah. And it was installed on Windows 95, so there was a whole list huge list of names of people and websites and everything that would get blocked from their computers. And within a few weeks of them completing this program of getting it installed on all the uh, Scientologists' uh, computers, then Windows 98 came out and it wiped it all out. Mm. Yeah. So uh, their efforts were overwritten. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very covert operation because um, someone got a copy of their installation disk, which didn't actually say that they were installing this thing. And I installed, uh, I installed it under a program that makes any installation reversible. Wow. So I installed it on the computer, looked at what it did. The, uh, this installation monitor made a list of all the files that it had modified, put backups of all the old ones, and it had actually made a, a new version of the main interface between the computer and the internet and put a little block into it. So, but then, so did it have some sort of effect built in it so that it was hard to delete? No, it was easy to delete once you knew the name of it, but oh, okay. people wouldn't even know that it was installed if they, um, if they hadn't been warned. Yeah, because when, when I found out about that, I was, that my, this was when I was finding out about the, uh, how the church uh, wasn't what I thought it was, um, and I found that really shocking when I found that out, because um, they they gave everyone CDs to install um, so that people could make their own Scientology website and talk about how good Scientology is, and then they added an extra thing into that CD that people didn't know about, this this Net Nanny program, and when I found out about that, I was like, wow, that's so shifty, you know what I mean? I was like, I, 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 was, I, was, it really, it, it, I was really surprised because um, a friend... Uh, mentioned who was around that in that time mentioned how he got the cd and put it in his computer and then i was like whoa he didn't even know that he was getting the net nanny at the same time it's amazing and i posted um deletion instructions on the internet and how to revert it so it oh, okay yeah <laughs> I'm so happy with me for that. <laughs> gosh Yes, yeah, so no, no wonder why you're not a fan of them. So it's not just that you um, audit people which they, which they wouldn't like. It's also that you uh, you you put information out there that um, reaches people. Yeah, I mean they probably don't like me for posting something into Wikipedia saying that uh, um, actually the trademarks of Scientology are not valid because the word was in use before. Um, before LOH used it, and he actually said so on a tape. So I posted the tape where LOH said, oh, he found the name in a library. 
Yeah, oh, <laughs> they wouldn't like you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, were you part of uh, helping write some of the Wikipedia pages for Scientology? No, I didn't get into that. Um, I just made a few amendments briefly, but I don't get into Wikipedia now. Mm. So. Yeah, because I, I found looking into the Scientology Wikipedia stuff, um, that it's not too bad. Like, I kind of was like, oh, it's not um, it's not too inaccurate. I was kind of impressed with it, to be honest. I think the church have been forbidden from making alterations to it. All their domain names were blocked. And yeah. So, mm. so, uh, so what do you see um, is the future of the church, just out of curiosity? It's been gradually disintegrating since um, the seventies, since all oh, eighties, well, since the mid eighties, yeah. I would say. Yeah. And we had, yeah. after the Dianetic Clear um, issues came out, and lots of people were attesting to Clear. There what were was, lots what of was that? Clear. Sorry, what was that? The Dian well, before nineteen seventy-eight. In order to reach clear, a person had to do a lot more auditing. They had to go through the grades, through Dianetics, power processing. They had to do the solo course. They had to do R6EW, and they had to do the clearing course until they had a particular cognition. Mm. But in 1978, LOH said that a lot of people had actually reached the state of clear on Dianetics or on certain other procedures. Mm. So suddenly the number of clears jumped from maybe 5,000 or 6,000 up by about 20,000 and over the years it got up to about 50,000 but a lot of those were people attesting and then de-attesting and then getting the CCRD and then there was an earlier version of it and so some people would attest three or four times so we don't even know if that 50,000 figure is valid. So, so that, that brings up a really good point. So are you saying with um, with your auditing, um, you use materials that are all prior to 1978? No. Um, there are issues that came out after 78 that I would say are valid. Just from my understanding of the tech and um, how LRH wrote, um, I would say that the false purpose rundown seems good. The happiness rundown. Um, the OT level stuff. Um, the OT level, the net for OTs, yes. Um, it looks like up to the point that he died, he was to some extent on the tech lines. So I don't think there's much that was really bad before then, except for I don't recall the date when all this weird sack checking of people came out on solar knots, but. Um, that doesn't seem like LOH. Yeah. Uh, so, but, so, so is it kind of like you, you, um, you, you do follow standard LOH tech, but you, some things you don't like this 1978, um, is it a particular issue you're talking about, a, a, a policy that was released? Oh, there was, um, well, I think this has been talked about on the net quite a lot and it's something... I'd left the church before it happened, but people had to go for six month checkups on solo knots. Mm. They had to pay to go to flag and then pay for extensive sack checks to make sure they were behaving ethically and not saying anything bad about David Miscavige or whatever. Yeah. And uh, these seem to be a case interruption. Yeah. And the person on a, on a successful action, they were having gains and even if they were doing fine, then they would still have to pay their money every six months, which was a good cash cow for Miscavige. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but this thing that happened in 1978, because I noticed it as well with the, the like the bulletin that was released or whatever. I I noticed that um, you know a lot of people were getting passed off as natural clears and stuff like that, and um, it sounds like it was better before that when it was like you know, a person was had really thoroughly become clear and after that it was suddenly like all these people could just get away with quicking, just shooting up the bridge, you know what I mean, and not really um, achieving each level properly. Uh, I think that happened to quite a lot, yes. And in the church they did introduce changes over the years and... Um, but generally, I would say that a lot of the people who were tested clear were, in fact, clear, 
because many of them had been in Scientology a long time and had a fair bit of auditing. Um, so it would have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis rather than... I, I think the, the state of clear was easier to attain than had been thought. Oh, okay, yeah. And just because a person was clear, it didn't necessarily mean that their grades were handled. So yeah. a person go clear and then handle their grades and then get on to OT levels. And it would vary depending on the sequence, depending on what auditing they'd had and their general case date. I remember when I was involved with the church um, and I was speaking to a guy two years ago and um, he he went clear as one of these people. I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was a natural clear, but he went clear without doing the grades. And I'd, I'd recently done the grades and I remember it would come up and he'd mentioned something like, oh, I haven't done the grades. And I remember thinking mm. in my head, because I thought it was a little bit aberrated and also I feel like the grades are good and, and, and everyone should do them. And I kind of remember just thinking, I reckon this guy should be doing the grades. And he, and he said something like, um, you know, I'm clear so I don't have to do the grades. Like I've already had that, that charge handled or something. And something in me was just like, that's not right. I think he should be doing the grades. Like I don't think he's had that charge handled like i know he's gone clear but you know he was I, you know, he was making out the fact that he'd gone clear means that that like is there's no point in him doing the grades no that isn't i would say that isn't true and most people in the independent field and in the church um do want people doing the grades there was a period around from 78, uh, maybe for 10 years, when a lot of people were not doing the grades and they were going on to OT levels and often doing them very quickly so yeah. that people would do the whole bridge in less than a year. And they'd finish OT2, OT3 very quickly. They'd get on to the upper levels. They'd be OT8 in a year. And basically they just, they hadn't finished anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think it was noticed by a lot of people in and out of the church that the grades do need to be uh, brought to an EP. But it's also true that if a person reaches the state of clear, they can re-stimulate the OT levels. And that depending on how a, person, a particular person's case goes, it may be better to look at a few things that they were stimulated after clear before getting on to the grades. Yeah. That would explain why a lot of people these days um, in the church are, you know, having to redo things and probably go back and do their grades and get everything properly done. Um, mm. I think it's good, the position we're in these days, because it's a bit more standard, as in we've got all this information of history and your generation were more the guinea pigs, I guess. And so what do you think of that? Do you think the younger generation now have it luckier in that they can really you know do things in the proper order and stuff um it depends where you go i think if they go to the church they're probably going to spend a vast fortune doing things that aren't necessary and i don't think the church have learned learned very much in the last 30 years um and so i'd say yes we were somewhat guinea pigs, um, but that the tech in the church really hasn't progressed much in the last 30 years. What do you think of GAT2? I think it's rubbish. I think that the LRH originally wanted the training very simple. We wanted it straightforward. People sit down, they do their re-meter drills, and they can become auditors within a few weeks. This extensive gap training is getting people spending hundreds and hundreds of hours on very robotic drills that don't really teach a person to audit, but they teach them uh, things like, well, if the preclear says this, what do you say? And they have long sheets of, if the preclear says, I want to pick my nose, what do you say? Oh, you tell him to go ahead. So it's making He's a robot order, auditor, like an audit out of a robot, yeah. <laughs> And yeah. then these people get confused when they're in a session and the preclear says there's a giraffe outside the window and the auditor looks at his sheet and there's nothing about giraffes. So he doesn't know what to say. Yeah. 
I mean, that the actual cases have come up of that. Yeah, so it makes the audit, the auditors just crappy auditors. Very robotic, and they don't understand the tech and how to apply it. They just understand how to say the words that they've been robotically taught to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if and if you look around the uh, in most of the ideologues and that, I mean, there's barely anyone training to be an auditor. And there's barely anyone buying e meters, and there's there's you know just occasionally you hear someone going clear and that, and it's um these are these are some of the reasons why you know because it's just like it's like the whole church has made the whole bridge a big stop you know a big mm-hmm. long slow stop um, yeah and there's so many crimes an auditor can commit that basically anyone scared silly of wanting to become an auditor yeah you know, if you miss old you're gonna come have if you uh, go past a misunderstood uh, if you miss out a comma in the right place in your worksheets uh, you didn't put the date and the PC's name on every page of the worksheets uh, and this whole list of things that have to be perfect and you have to uh, get videoed and very robotic videos um, well yeah they're just not making auditors yeah, and and it's just like, um, you know, obviously it's good to promote standard tech, but they've used this thing of like keeping the tech standard as a justification for just making just all these stops and all these regulations that are just ridiculous. And and nowadays in the church, it's like you can't even just buy an e-meter. It's like you have to fill out a contract, and uh, you have to get a license renewal on that e-meter. And it's just like, you know, it's just all these stops and it's just, that's why, you know, the independent movement is where it's at and why it's growing because people can just, you know, go and buy a secondhand meter and uh, people are just free to be themselves, you know. Mm. I mean, there's the other side of it, which is that there's a lot of um, what one would term squirreling in the independent field, people doing things that just aren't anywhere near Scientology and trying to pass it off as Scientology. So people have to be, I mean, you have things like auditors who think that the auditor can hold the cans. Okay. <laughs> he's auditing somebody over the telephone and he's holding the cans and he thinks the reads that he, get over, he gets over the telephone are valid for the pre case. case. Hmm. Um, and uh, you get people being trained to audit their food. Uh, really? <laughs> that, that's serious. Wow. Um, if one goes along to one of Bill Robertson's groups, you, um, when they get to around OT12, OT13, they're taught to train entities to audit their food to make sure they don't get any anthata coming in. Interesting. Um, but it's kind of... So so yeah so it's just like in the independent field it's like um it's just a bit more like the wild wild west isn't it where you just have to be a bit more um cautious but at least you're not guaranteed shit auditing where it seems like in the church you're sort of guaranteed to get shit auditing aren't you um maybe some places it's okay it's very expensive and um probably quite laborious um i haven't talked to people who've had much had any decent auditing recently in the church i think it's been a long time mm. yeah yeah I, I did um the gat2 the gat2 auditing and um it seems like they've quickied the grades they've made them a lot quicker and it seemed like gat1 people were bogging down a lot more to, so to solve that they just quickied the grades i don't really have data on it um I don't know what people were doing in the grades on GAT1. I wasn't around then. Yeah. And so I would say the grades were probably laborious under GAT1. And it's possible they've actually brought it down to a more realistic time. It's, but, yeah, uh, yeah. It seems like from what I've looked into it, they've, they've brought it down a lot, um, a lot faster. Um, Anyway, but um, I was going to ask something. So, so what do you th- what do you think is the future for the church? Because I'm just sort of interested in that. Um, I think some people think that it's 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 designed to slowly get shut down, um, 
but I kind of feel like it, it's um, it's going to last, but just last small for a really, really long amount of time. Yeah, that's the feeling I have. It will just... And David Miscavige is quite a um, forceful personality, and uh, he's not someone who's just going to roll over and uh, let it die in its existing form. I think he wants to... He'll keep it going as long as he's alive. Yeah, he seems pretty uh, dedicated. But then there's the problem of succession in that he's thrown out a lot of the decent people and I don't know that he has, actually has anyone left in the organization competent enough to carry on. But I would expect once he goes that the church would mellow out somewhat. And, um, but it would also, without his ruthless driving force, it will probably get smaller and smaller. So it'll be something like the Theosophical Society, and uh, it'll just become a small group that, um, well, maybe still has a few properties left, but uh, it needs a total, um, it needs a new start with someone uh, like LRH back running the show who knows how to how to build something like that up. Yeah, like get because, them out of the hole they're stuck in. Yeah. Um, I, I, have you watched some of the, the Skype... F no, no the, yeah, the video footage of the um, the drone that's flying over some of those bases in California? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. The thing I noticed about some of those footages of, of the different locations was um, how quiet they were. How, how the, what, It didn't seem like there's a lot of action going on at these gold bases and all that sort of stuff i think as soon as a drone comes near there's a security guard on the phone oh. or a walkie -talk saying okay they're coming hide hide <laughs> yeah do you really think that oh yeah oh, okay because okay. I, I i didn't think that I, I just thought that um i just thought i just thought wow these gold bases are really empty things are really quiet you know like things aren't happening <laughs> they probably are quiet i mean people are inside yeah. there's not much the outside they're going to be sitting at their lot of desks and their offices doing whatever they're doing so you're not going to see if you go around to clear water you don't see much activity um except for lunchtime dinner time when people are transported between the buildings so you wouldn't see much on the drones because it's just not happening outside what do you what do you think about the sea org at the moment do you think that they've um they've got less staff than than ever or, or more than ever what do you think um i don't really know um from what little i know of what's going on in the states i think they're recruiting a lot of people from poorer countries who are happy with sea org wages and conditions yeah I don't think they're recruiting many Americans or British or Australian people. They're um, basically, they find someone who's not very well educated, who's used to earning 20 cents an hour, and uh, they put them through a minister's course and uh, say they're vitally needed on posts in America, and they get them a visa, yeah. a green card. When I was involved with the church, because um, when, when you're in... When you don't know anything about the history at all, you just you're so susceptible to all this info that comes out of the church. So when I was involved with it, if you'd asked me two years ago um, how much Sea Org staff there was, I'd probably say, yeah, it's probably the most ever. Like I'll I'll, I'll be like, yeah, it's probably it, it, like it's probably the highest it's ever been. But now it's like, oh, it could be the smallest it's ever been. But it's just interesting how how easily how brainwashing works. It like you you exclude certain information, then other information, you, you give them a lot of that, and eventually you create a person that thinks the way you want them to think. I'd say the Sea Org is between two and 5,000 internationally. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'd say the total number of Scientologists on the planet who are actively involved with the church doing something is in the region of 20,000. Yeah. Yeah. There's no eight million. <laughs> no, that. There's no what? There's no eight million. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's definitely not, yeah. 
Yeah, I can I can definitely say with Sea Org, it's probably about three hundred or five hundred in Australia, two fifty maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So. So. So just thinking, what? Why should someone do Scientology? Someone who's listening to this. You mean who doesn't know anything about it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose they need to learn something about it first before it's a bit of a bit of a broad question to answer in a few sentences. But uh, if someone wants to learn more about themselves, to um, find something about their spiritual nature, to explore the possibilities of learning about reincarnation, about their past lifetimes, regaining some of the experiences and knowledge they had, um, getting rid of a lot of their personal difficulties and inhibitions, um, learning to become more capable in areas of life, then it's something they can look into. Um, with, with the past life thing, let's say someone was a photographer in their past life. Do you think with auditing um, and them remembering some of this past life stuff, do you think that they could, they could actually suddenly start becoming a really good photographer without even having done much training? Uh, if someone had had a lot of training in a past lifetime, I think they could regain... Um, a lot of that ability very quickly without doing all the training gig again. Uh, I mean, if you look at someone like Angelina Jordan, are you familiar with her, the no. singer? No. And this girl is 10 years old and she's singing as if she's been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. You know, note perfect, has charisma, has, uh, she's a perfect singer. And she started, I think, at the age of seven or eight. And to me, that she looks like someone who's learned to do that in a past lifetime. I don't think anyone could become that good in two or three years without prior experience. Yeah. Um, there have been other, I don't recall her name straight off, but other instances of very young children showing a huge ability in some field without this lifetime training. Yeah. And to me, it seems I can't see any other option, but uh, they've been, they've done it before. Yeah. Yeah. It's really funny because um, people just, uh, who don't know about this sort of stuff, just pass it off as, you know, and a, a coincidence or an, a sort of odd sort of thing, but there's sort of answers for why these people are like this like my um i've noticed that my mum gets sparked up by photography you get sort of excited about it and sort of gets into it and suddenly like becomes more you know what i mean her hat suddenly changes around a camera yet she's had no formal training in photography and it's the sort of thing where you're like you where you think you know i bet you she was a photographer in her past life because all of a sudden she's like you know, setting up the camera and getting people into positions, and suddenly becoming this, this, this beingness, and it's uh, it's quite funny to watch. And so, have you noticed that with with people like actually in your environment? Well, I mean, I mean myself, I was. Um, it seems like electronics. I, I had no formal training in electronics. I played around with a few things. Um, built a couple of radios when I was in my teens and then I ended up on the ship and suddenly the electronics guy went mad and they didn't have anyone to replace him and so I just started picking up the manuals and going through them and I was fixing the radars and the radios and everything else when I was just 19 years old um, and I don't think there were many people who could who could do that um, it was just an area that was very open to me and easy. Yeah. Well, something like learning German is totally abysmal for me. It's, oh, you know, yeah. Gee. I just can't do it. But I can learn a computer language uh, very quickly. Yeah. So uh, 
there are areas I feel I have whole track experience in, and uh, areas where I'm just I have to start from scratch. Just out of curiosity, do you how many um do you, do you know who you were in your past life and the lifetime before that like pretty accurately? Um, there are things that I there are times when I've had certainty on it and times uncertainty, and. At the moment, for me, the the situation with reincarnation doesn't seem as simple as presented. In other words, as an example, a lot of people say they were Jesus Christ. Yeah. A lot of people. A lot of people say they were Henry VIII. Yeah. A lot of people say they were Cleopatra. Um, but not very many people say they were peasants who didn't have enough bread and they were beaten every day as slaves. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, obviously, that most of the people were poor people who weren't actually doing very much. Then there's another factor, is that most people cannot have had past incarnations on this planet. Just because of the number of people who currently have bodies. The, if, you add, if you add up how long people live and that sort of thing, mm. well, most people couldn't have had a past lifetime. Yeah. Because there weren't that many people around in the past. Yeah. So there's a lot, um, a lot that's unknown, a lot to be sorted out as far as how this whole reincarnation thing works. Because it isn't as simple as all the billions of people on the planet now weren't around 200 years ago. There weren't enough bodies. This is really, really interesting because this brings on to the whole past life and natural clear thing because it's like you know it's like the amount of people who were from like 85 to the year 2000 or something in the church that were passed off as being past life clear um it, it's as if suddenly all the people in the 50s who were doing dianetics mm. just dropped dead just dropped dead and suddenly reincarnated and then they were all getting born in the 60s and 70s and coming around in the 90s and saying oh i, I was actually clear in my past life and it was it seems quite strange because it's like it's, the statistics don't match up it's just like it's you know it's just it's quite odd and also it's like it's like this thing where everyone wants to be jesus or cleopatra and and everyone wants to be you know a past life clear and they don't want to be you know someone who just did grade 1 or something you know <laughs> So it's mm. like, what, 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 what do you think of this whole natural clear thing and all that? And, and uh, do you think um, you've gone clear, obviously? So then, next lifetime and stuff, do you think you have to do your grades again and all that? No, no definitely not. Um, if a person finishes grades this lifetime, then they're good with that. And, and so they may, so they'll be found they out. Be, yeah. With with those tech uh, with, with the tech thingos and stuff and the, and the 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 list you can find out if someone's past life because it just seems that it's an untrustworthy way of working out if that person did go clear past life because all these people are getting passed off as being clear when they don't seem to be. Well, eventually they're going to fall by the wayside and have to get picked up again. So if yeah. somebody's gone very quickly to clear and didn't make it or falsely attested, then somewhere along the line, they're going to have problems and they're not going to be able to audit the upper levels. And then at that point, one would have to say, OK, well, let's check over from the beginning. Let's see, did you reach this grade? Did you reach that grade? And go through it all and um, pick them up at the point where they're, that they've actually reached. Yeah. And it is standard standard tech for CS Series 2. You yeah. Want to I like said when a person has problems, that you find out where what grade they actually attained on the bridge, and then uh, get them moving from that point. Yeah, mm. yeah, but and so um, yeah, so with with a lot of these people who were t attesting to past life clear or natural clear in the nineties and stuff, um, you just think that they, you would just be reordering them a lot of them to redo things, sort of. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make any generalisation about it. 
Um, yeah. I would say it has to be looked at on a case by case basis. And I would expect in a way that a lot of the people who dropped off the lines for whatever reasons uh, died or whatever, past life stuff, they would be drawn to Scientology again in this lifetime. So that although the number might seem quite large who are attesting to natural clear or past life clear, um, I think they would find they would feel attracted towards Scientology, recognize it. So the number might would be far higher than would uh, occur in the no, uh, natural population. Yeah. And another thing which I disagree with LRH about and might seem rather weird is that I think a lot more things have happened like Scientology in the past than he thought. Okay. And that way back a long time, we did have parts of the technology and a lot of people did reach clear. Okay. In millions of years ago. Yeah. Uh, I've just come up with recalls on my own about it and other people have come up with it. And I think there are certain points on the track when parts of Scientology, not the whole thing, were being used and making people were making case gain. Good. Sounds good. So a lot of this could be surfacing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting issue. Um, so uh, I was just wondering, what, what's the what's some wins that you've gotten from Scientology? Myself, I think... Um... I think the biggest win was when the whole track disappeared. Wow. Uh, um, I was auditing Expanded Dianetics back in 78. And, um, I ran through a particular long process. It was about an hour. And suddenly this huge sort of black mass of um, 100 meters going forward... Uh, looking like a sort of spaceship from nowhere, just went boof. And uh, I didn't have any pictures, I didn't have any whole track, it was all gone. Um, and that was probably the biggest shift I had um, at one point, you know, just in one session. Since then, I think the major, the biggest gains I've had from Scientology have been on knots. And it's like going on each day, auditing each day, and more and more opens up. I yeah. noticed. Uh, oh yeah, can I can I ask you about the um, the knots thing because um, and it's probably mainly the church has given it such a bad name, the OT levels. Um, but yeah, it seems like you know a really questionable area. You know, you hear about some people you know getting unwell, and some people. Um, going a little bit, a little bit crazy, you know, a little bit like the hearing voices and stuff. And I, I, there's something really interesting about hearing voices because all these people who who are in psych wards and that talk about hearing voices and all this sort of stuff. There's something going on there. But um, uh, so so you reckon that you 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 do trust the OT levels and they are good and and when when you when you do them right, they are awesome, right? Yeah. Good. Yeah. But I think they're done very strangely a lot of the time. Like what? what like what do they do in the church? Like without getting into too much um, confidentiality, what are they doing in the church? Are they just squirreling and 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 the members are PTS, so it's just not working as well. Well, I would say the first, the way the pricing is structured, when a person pays for OT two, OT three, the church doesn't get any more money until the person finishes that level. And then they will get money for their OT4, their auditing. They tend to push people through very quickly on OT2 and 3. Yeah. Which means that later they will need more review auditing and they will have to pay for that. Um, so I think the major thing in the church is that OT2 and OT3 are run far too quickly and the person isn't properly um, in a good enough case state to make it through to OT8. 
I think ev- it seems like nearly everything in the church is being is being quickied. Even like when it comes to just reading the Dianetics book and stuff like that, I noticed that it's just got this philosophy of you know the high stats thing and, and do everything in, in in a hurry, and it just it ruins the whole point of Scientology. You know, like the like I remember a soup came up to me and and I was studying I think history of man or something like that, and you know I was you know going along studying carefully trying to understand it and getting a lot from it, and she was like standing there like bragging about how fast she studied it, and it's just like you know I don't care it's not it's not good to study something fast, you're not getting any data from it, you know mm. yeah I mean there is a huge difference in the rate at which people can study something and apply it it's like a hundred to one, maybe more oh wow. Uh, I observed it at Flag. I mean, we had people on course who could read half a page in two hours. Yeah. Um, in the Sea Org. And we had people who could read a hundred pages in the same time and understand it and apply it. Okay. Yeah. So there is a huge difference. And, um, but. I think the church do tend to quickie things. Um, they quickie the things which get the stats up if they're um, if they're quickied. Yeah. The, th- the things they don't quickie are sack checks, because a person has to keep on paying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say that they, there's certain things that they don't quickie, and there's certain things that they absolutely quickie. And I remember I was doing objectives auditing. And my twin was coming close to completing the whole course. And there was pressure from, because I was on staff at the same time, there was pressure from executives and staff to get him completed. And I was the auditor, right? And so I, I sort of was looking at his case and stuff and, you know, writing things to the CS. And I, I was seeing this phenomenon of like the CS and me kind of getting pressured to finish this guy faster than what he really needed. And. And it, and I got it really pissed me off at one point. I was just like, "What the hell is going on? This is just not right." You know, it's someone's case. It stats and you know, you execs. It's nothing to do with this. You know, things take as long as they take, and it, it's kind of maybe concerned in that like, if if the, the auditor and the CS aren't smart, they can just get and if they're not that ethical as well, they can just get pressured into quicking people on things to get the stats up. Oh. I, mean, I noticed why well, even when I was at Flag, uh, it's been worse than that, uh, worse since. I would look at the staff auditing completions, and every week in the international training org there might be fifty to a hundred completions less and listed, and that would be their stat number of case completions. And then I would look at them. There might be one grade zero one OT2 and 98 sack checks <laughs> even back then. what you year was that check. um that was back around 1980 oh okay yeah yeah I, I understand though it seems like that, that, that they were more turbulent times and there was more attacks going on um whereas nowadays the church is just quiet and just no, not no, not many people have anything. No one's having anything to do with them. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. I would say the church is getting more attacks now than it's ever had. Oh, really? I mean, we weren't really getting a lot of attacks back then. The um, there's a lot of talk about it, but um, I think the church was actually expanding more oh, yeah, before nineteen eighty two. And and I would go along to course rooms. I remember in 78, I went um, on a tour around the United States and I was recruiting people for the Sea Org. And I would walk into some course rooms in a mission and see 200 people on course. In a mission? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 200 people in the Dynamics course room. 200 people in basic courses. No way. So how many people in the whole mission, would you say? Oh, there could have been four or 500 public in some of those missions. It's kind of like a Scientology school, like it was actually happening, whereas now it's like just a few people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 
the missions, the destruction of the missions was the end of Scientology, basically. Yeah. The end of Scientology expansion. Yeah. It was like cooking the golden goose. Yeah. They ate the golden egg because the missions were sending so many people to flag. They were sending their staff to training for flag. The mission holders, their staff were getting auditing at flag. The whole of flag expansion was funded by the missions. Yeah. And there are people, there were quite a few missions out there, and the, mainly on the West Coast or um, a few other locations in the US, and they would continually have hundreds of students on course. They had more people at one of those missions than flag had sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Um, but then the greedy Sea Org financial um, thieves went in there. They demanded all the money that the missions had as fines for crimes which never happened. And basically they busted all the missions, destroyed them. They made a few million out of doing it, but they destroyed Scientology. Yeah, yeah. And just for people who are listening who don't know, don't know much about the um, indie Scientologists, um, we, bas we basically believe that since uh, LRH went off lines in the 80s, the church has just been on a, um, a decline and, uh, and it's gotten worse and, and, and it's changed and it's actually not standard tech. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, this is what I'm talking about because if someone gets into Scientology in 2002 or something, they um they don't realize that um that you know in 78 there actually was a bunch of a lot of people doing scientology and there was a lot of activity going on like people don't know about the history of the church so nowadays they can just get they can easily get sucked into what's going on and just have no idea what it used to be and and these are some of the things that made me realize you know the changes that had been made and what was going on. You know, I was, I remember when I first found out, you know, that, that there was actually a lot of people doing Scientology in the seventies. And I was just like, what? It was just like, what? There was that many, like stuff was actually going on. Like, like no, what's a lot more going on in the late seventies than there is now. Yeah. It was just like, Oh wow. This, it was like, wow. And, and, and it's just kind of like a, it's kind of like a shock because when you find that out, you suddenly start going, well, what's, What's happened? Why? Why has things changed? And then you start investigating things. So it's like, you know, uh, at the moment, the people in the church and that they're not going to be walking around parading. Hey, things were a lot better before David Miscavige came along. They're not going to be you know, announcing that, and David Miscavige isn't going to be announcing that either. You know. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah, that's um, it. Need in order to to get Scientology moving again, it needs a strong leader and it needs a lot of the kind of people like Alan Walter for example who are building up the Scientology field. It needs missions that aren't being controlled by flag management with a huge bureaucracy and they're um, taking all the money out that they can. Uh, it does need, it needs some strong leaders. The, the, uh yeah, and it's just like the the stops on the lines are just it's just epic. Like if you want to train to be an auditor and you buy your materials for level one to level four or something, there's nothing confidential in those, is there? It's just the standard stuff. Yet, yet yeah. if you want to buy them, they'll give you just your level one when the routing form says you're up to that level. Uh, and you have to go to the bookstore, and then they'll, you know, three months later when you finish your training on a level one, then they'll give you the level two, and they won't just hand you the e-meter. They won't just hand you all the materials that you purchased, which is just common sense and what they should do. They just have all these little things that are like, you know, oh, it's supposed to be this way, and the whole justification is it's helping Scientology and making it more standard, but all the meanwhile, it's not. It's just it's just slowing down the expansion of Scientology. Yeah, it's control control mechanisms and you used to be able to buy an e-meter and you said oh well i'm training as an auditor i need a meter and you walk into the bookshop give me money and you got it uh, yeah. that was about it 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, Whereas now you probably have to apply or we have to send in a, a thing o to make sure you qualify for buying an e-meter and make sure you qualify for doing this and and that. And it's and like when they when they released new e-meters uh, back in the 70s and stuff, did suddenly everyone be for, were they all forced to use the new e-meter? Um, no, it's difficult to remember. They, I remember people were using the Mark V when, after the 6 came out. I personally felt that the Mark VI was not better than the Mark V. I thought the reads were more sluggish, but it wasn't something I could dare say. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but um, was everyone forced to? Because the way it is now, I'm pretty sure, it, like with this new e meter that they've re- released, it's like no, you have to all use this new e meter, and you and your old one, old e meter is worthless. Yeah, the Mark V was okay up to a certain level. I think once you got onto Solar Notch, you had to use the Mark VI or Seven, or you know when that came out. Mm. But uh, I mean, we're talking about the period just just before when I left the Mark VI, um, and the Seven was after I left. Uh, so um, I didn't really have a lot of data on what's happened over the last. 30, 35 years. Yeah, it, it, it just seems like something with um, Miscavige, it seems like more of a Miscavige sort of thing where it's like, you know, I'm releasing a new e-meter and everyone's being forced to buy it. It seems like it seems like back when Hubbard was around, he would release new e-meters so people just would buy it and, and you're, not, you're not forced to buy this new e-meter, you know? Well, it didn't really happen. Uh, once the Mark V was um, developed, then... He didn't change things. He just wanted the Mark V used until, until I don't know how much he was involved with the Mark VI. Somehow it seemed strange to me that he would approve the Mark VI, because to me it was an inferior meter to the Mark V. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if somebody else okayed it or what happened, uh, but he wasn't in favour of changing e-meters. Yeah. At yeah. the time, aren't you? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like it's a bit of a distraction, you know, to make this new fancy colours and, you know, like they, I heard, I heard they were releasing some sort of e-meter that was like to to raise money as well. Um, so you know, it was so expensive because it was also a donation. But they were releasing these gold-plated e-meters that were like a hundred thousand dollars. Did you hear about that? Huh? I haven't heard that one now, but uh, yeah, yeah, and I made I, sure. I asked. Ash- it's cash cows. Yeah. Exactly. You, know, you get one of each color, $5,000 each. You know? It was crazy, man. And the person who told me that, I made sure I asked him a few times. I was like, are you serious they were selling this for 100000 And he was like, yeah. He was He was like, it was like a, it was a silver gold, or gold-plated e-meter. <laughs> and it was... I it was, think he used to do it with LOH autograph books. Yeah, yeah. Um, they would go for a fortune, and people actually thought that LOH autographed them, but... You know, I know the lady who did it. Uh, they didn't even get an LOH autograph book for their money. So you telling me that the, the church was actually selling books claiming that they were signed by LOH and they weren't? Yeah. Serious? Yeah, well, well, that doesn't surprise me because if they're selling these fancy gold-plated e-meters that are $100,000, which is just so... Like, even if you factor in, you know... You want you, you want to help your church out by donating a few thousand, like just it's so excessive. And then at the end, the person who buys that e meter just ends up being a poor old person. <laughs> you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. and, and they're probably not even they, and it, and it slows their progress at the bridge because they can't afford to get the bridge because they spent it on some stupid e meter. You know? Mm. And the the Mark Eight, this, I mean, maybe they cost three hundred dollars to make, and they sell them for five thousand. Yeah. Uh, um, with, with this e meter you, that you're talking about, do you have to um, the one you're making? Um, do you have to uh, get it recalibrated, or is it like this type of ele- electronic stuff where it doesn't need any servicing? It's just perfect. Um, it doesn't need a trim knob. It doesn't need recalibration. Uh, this basically has a voltage stabilizer inside that's not going to change for 50 years, so there's no need for recalibration. Wow. That's good, huh? 
Yeah. yeah that's, that talk about an update. So, so you actually built this yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how much do you sell these for? Five hundred. See, that's fantastic, huh? So you're getting a meter that's it's it's got an automatic TA. It's much better mm-hmm. and it's much cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And there's uh, in the independent field, there's other people making similar e meters, is there? Um, there's a couple of people making meters, and there was Barry Pemberthy making the ability meters, but uh, he must be very old now, uh, so I don't, I haven't really heard much about that. Um, so uh, I think the the most productive people making meters at the moment are making computerized meters. Um, there's a couple of people in Russia who churn out theta meters. And you don't have the main box, you just have a little thing that puts the uh, display up on your computer screen. What do you think of that? Um, I, desi- uh, I designed and made one myself um, called the C-meter uh, before the Russians did it. Um, and I sold maybe a hundred of them. Um, and I had a sort of full screen e-meter on the computer or laptop or whatever. Some people really liked it. I myself, after using it for a while and using the mechanical ones, I've gone back to just using the mechanical meter. I find the the mechanical movement, it's something I can look at and I feel more certain than looking at a display on a screen with the pixelation and whatever happens. Um, I like the mechanical movement better. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, it comes with, uh, you know, cans and cords and all that sort of stuff, and they're good quality, are they? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I, for auditing myself, I prefer, um, instead of cans, I use these fingertip electrodes. Um, ah, you can see them there. These things go onto the fingers. Yep. And you get a connection that doesn't show any body motion. Really? So I, move, I move my hand around. Wow. Uh, if you look at the the meter here. Yep. And if I'm moving my hand, it's not affecting the reads. That's these are these are sort of the improvements that LIH would be really really improved like really happy about like these are these are serious proper improvements not just like the new the newest e meter that the church is releasing is um it's just like what more clearer reads like that's and and it has like a time zone feature like like these actually the pr- improvements you're talking about are like they're proper huh they're actually u- useful yeah. yeah. I, I don't think the Mark 8 meter is an improvement over the earlier ones. I don't know what they could have improved except for a few, well, they say automatic calibration of the start of every session. But wouldn't it be better to have something that didn't need calibrating for 50 years? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at the advancing, <laughs> the advances of the iPhone, that sort of stuff, and the e-meter is just, like, compared to 1950, it's not It's in the church. It's not a huge advancement, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean, they've changed a lot of things and made it look fancier. And maybe they count the the TA is counted as 3.01 or 3.02, um, but that's meaningless anyway. It doesn't make any difference whether the TA is 3.75 or 3.76. I've got a <laughs> um, I've got a Mark Seven, and just looking at this e meter you've got and comparing the Mark Seven to what you've got, it's just like. It just seems like it's it, provided that it, it it gets gets the job done and is trustworthy in session, which which you're saying it is right. Then it's just way better. It's way better, you know. Because oh, yeah. it, 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 it and, it, and it must make do, can can people train learn all their training on it? Because it must make things a lot easier. Yeah, well, they don't need as much training. I mean, they don't spend ages fiddling with a TA knob because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, uh, yeah, it's much faster to train. It, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. Direct, yeah, anyway, it's interesting. 
I mean, obviously the church is... I, I'm, I, I, know, I know I'm talking a lot negative about the church, but it's just like... The more you look into it, the more you just like Jesus. Like, what? What's why? Why haven't they got these new adjust new features on their e meter? It's just ridiculous. Mm. Well, they're stuck with, and they have this thing of standard tech, and it puts a noose around their neck. Um, if they want to improve anything, and as far as e meters go, they somehow have to justify it by finding something L O H said before he died, hidden away in some little notes or whatever. That justifies changing standard tech. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like an improvement. When LH has standard tech, he basically means don't just skip grade one or don't make grade one a new command that says, do you like chickens or something like that. That's squirreling, that's changing the tech. But there's a big difference between, you know, improving the e meter and squirreling. It's like some people like they can't understand what L R H is talking about. You know, they don't they don't seem to be able to duplicate the whole idea, you know? But some people are auditing with the auditor holding the cans. Yeah. Some people are auditing over the telephone without a meter. Um some people are um give lectures on the significance of LOH's uh, astrological birth chart in the develop of, uh, development of Scientology. Um, uh, people go off down all these weird, uh, strange paths of squirreling. Like uh, one lady started running, uh, she heard a briefing course tape that said you needed to list goals for a thousand goals to get the right goal. And she created something called Dion, Dionysus, uh, where everyone was doing these huge long goals lists because she never got to the tape on the briefing course where our age said, well, if you're doing long, long lists, then you're auditing over our rudiments. She just didn't get that far. And so mm. a whole weird squirrel tech was built out of somebody who just hadn't studied the tech. Yeah. And that and that's yeah, and that's what squirreling is. It's not just you know releasing an improvement on e meter that works and actually helps you in session. You know that's not squirreling. You know, it's just all about intelligence and using common sense and stuff. And um, but uh, but but you did mention earlier that you do some Skype auditing. Now I mean that that'll that will get criticised by people. What what do you think of that? Well, it works. Um, one needs your decent equipment like you've got and I've got uh, to make it work and the auditor needs to have the skills to be able to to audit it's, uh, I think it needs a bit more presence and it's not something that's workable for everyone you have to really talk to a person make sure they they have to be at a certain case level to be auditable over Skype yeah. You can't take somebody who needs their objectives and try running, look at that wall, thank you, walk over to that wall. I mean, doing that over Skype just isn't going to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 speaking of objectives, uh, with the uh, GAT2, uh, they've made the objectives level, they've called it SRD, so it's the survival rundown nowadays, and it's a lot bigger. It's got many, many more processes, um, and I've done it, and it with a lot of processes. Uh, what's your opinion of that? Do you reckon that's just squirrel or what? It, the SRD was actually introduced by LOH in 1980, and uh, around 1980. It wasn't some recent invention, and it did have a lot of processes on it. Um, it took me about 150 hours of auditing and 150 hours on my twin to get through it when I did it. Um, some people who are heavier cases were going up to 600 hours mm. each way on co-audit. Okay. And what I saw was that the, the results that people were getting from doing those long hours on objectives were worth the work. Ah, so, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's like funny because I was actually thinking that. I was thinking that with the GAT2, Things have been quickied, but I I didn't mind the uh, SRD. I thought the SRD was a, a good change. 
except mm. maybe too many processors. But maybe that's because the CS was just not that switched on and was ordering too many. But um, mm. no, I don't. Yeah, there may be more. I think on some cases it was too. There could have been more processors added because I saw people who would run too lightly on the processors who obviously weren't getting them flat. And they might have needed some extra processes at the beginning to get the yeah the C switches to bite properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. That's what it was. It was like um, GAT one had the standard sort of objective processes, and this survival rundown had heaps and heaps of undercuts and a lot more um, uh, smaller, like faster sort of processes. And anyway, but yeah, that, that's something like it's not all bad. GAT two. Some of it was definitely improvements and. Uh, but GA2, the SRD wasn't GA2. It was something that came from LOH 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Yeah, they just put it back in again. Yeah, so it was the... Um, it actually dropped out. Oh, it must have dropped out in the early 80s uh, because I didn't hear very much about it um, after I left. And I think it was a new... A new flavor of the month came along, or flavor of the day, and uh, it just dropped out. I wouldn't be it surprised. Big, I wouldn't be surprised. If, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the reasons it dropped out was because of um, the fact that they just don't like people doing long and thorough levels where they can't charge them heaps of money, where they're just co-auditing it. Um, yeah. I, I could just see because it seemed like in the early '80s when LH left and the whole squirreling started to happen and people started being quickied up the bridge and stuff um it seems like that that would make sense that this level this srd thing would really annoy the execs because people are coordinating it for ages and that but it was actually the time of flag when staff co uh, staff auditing was at its highest ever they have a big course room um 20 30 sessions going on at once I was supervising it for a while. Um, yeah, I was sort of sitting there with a queue for fixing up PCs. And, uh, it was a very active time for staff auditing. And now staff auditing I don't think exists except for sec checks. Yeah, it died away, huh? Yeah. Mm. That was one of the biggest reasons I saw for Scientology becoming smaller. was uh, They just failed to look after the staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, w- I want to do some time traveling uh, with you. Uh, I, was, mm. I, I want to wonder, uh, like, how did you first get into Scientology? It was um, 1971. I was studying at Bournemouth College, and I just saw a notice up on the wall so, with the aims of Scientology on it, and I actually thought it was some sort of new political group. Um but the na- I'd read the name in the newspaper somewhere, and I thought, oh, okay, and I went along, and there was a guy there, a mission holder, and he was running a TRs course. And I sat down and did some TRs, and it was like, boom, okay, this is this works. Yeah. So I I got a hold of um, Scientology 88808, and I read that cover to cover. <laughs> wow, it seems a bit of high gradient. <laughs> Yeah, and I just thought, wow, okay, that's it. And so I said, give me the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and what was your, and so you just started doing Scientology from there, and uh, did you join staff at the mission or something, or what? Uh, no, I, um, I was uh, still studying school, college. Um, I was at university, and after a year, I decided to leave and join the Sea Org. So in 1972, I went out to St. Hill, joined the Sea Org, and a couple of months later, I was off sailing the ocean with LOH. Cool. And so did you um, Did you get to meet LOH and stuff? Yeah. Wow. So what's, what, sort of, what sort of person is he like? What sort of personality? Uh, he's impressive. He's a powerful guy. Uh, and I could feel if he went for a walk off the ship, when he was coming back, I would feel him coming back when he was maybe two or three hundred meters away. Wow! Uh, you know, boof, okay, he's on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
about his presence. Well, if, if you if you look at the history of Scientology and, and and his life, you look at it and you're like, wow, this guy was really able to get stuff done, you know? And it's really impressive. It's just like he was, yeah, he was really powerful. It was just like this this guiding force or something, and he just, it, it's really interesting, you know? Hmm. Oh, yeah, he definitely got things done. Yeah, yeah, it's like, because like, a lot of people be like, how, like, you know, a lot of people will be jealous. They'll be like, how, how can he get so much done? How can he just do this? And he just did stuff, you know? Mm. And it was, it was contagious. I mean, when I left the Sea Org, um, I started computer programming. And uh, I found when I would go and start running computer programs, I'd be doing the work sometimes five or ten times as fast as the existing people. I walk into my first boss said, OK, you finish that now. Just get a science fiction book, read it for two weeks. I'm not turning this in for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's going to make us look bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. We got used to a speed of production in the Sea Org that was way above what most people accomplish outside. Yeah, because you, you look at L- LRH's life and you look at all the stuff he, he did and you're like, shit, you know, like, wow. I mean, this guy was really talented and really had an ability because it's just like, he just did, he got, he got a lot done. He just got cycles mm-hmm. done and, and, it, and it seemed like he, um, he did it pretty effortlessly as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. He didn't work with effort. He just decided. Boom. Uh, he was operating at the level of postulates. Yeah. Uh, it's like instead of okay, I've got to drag my ass up out of the seat and get over there. It was a boom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he would move very quickly. Things would happen quickly. There was no effort involved. Did did you get to speak to him personally and get an idea of what sort of personality he was in a casual way? No. No? He didn't have casual conversations with most of the crew. There were only a few people there, his, close, his aides, people close to him that he talked to. And the way when he was talking with people, he wouldn't talk to people or with them. He would lecture them. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't a conversationalist. Yeah. As yeah. a speaker, a lecturer, and people would go in there, they'd sit down, and I would start talking, and they wouldn't get more than a sentence or two in. He'd talk for an hour and then send them off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just interesting. You'll be just, just get an idea of what sort of personality he was and... So you could feel his presence and stuff like that, and he was like a leader. Yeah. He had quite a few similarities to Donald Trump, I think. Yeah, Trump seems pretty similar. Like, he's got this sort of um, this powerful leaderness because Trump did a pretty big, <laughs> pretty big effort in getting elected. Like, he had so much against him. And uh, it's just like you look at it and you're like, Jesus, and he just managed to pull it off. Like, he, a real big Satan or something, and, you know? Yeah, and I'll reserve judgment until we see what he gets done in a few years. But uh, I'm quite hopeful, actually, that he'll he'll make some positive changes. Yeah, yeah, we need it. Um, so, what was what was uh, what were things like on the ship back then? Um, ooh. I suppose it was productive. People were. People were mostly cheerful, um, getting things done, friendly. There was a certain level of snootiness in the upper levels. Was well, uh, that mean like, like, like they're snobbery, like they thought they were better than other people? Which oh, Scientology yeah. has always had. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, was a, there were the sort of people that, the snobbish layer, uh, but there were also a lot of people who were open, friendly, and... Um, Proper Scientologists. Hmm. I think a lot of them felt, a lot of the people at the top felt that they were incompetent and they were sitting on a sort of mist withhold of incompetence. 
because a lot of the people close to LRH just were not competent. Mm. There were only a few that I would say, well, that's, that's somebody who got things done. And there were a lot who just, nah, they, weren't out, they weren't up to doing things. Hmm. Um, some of the people who criticize LRH, and, and it's just funny because you speak to someone like you and, you and you say nice stuff about LRH, but then you hear some of these people who hate Scientology and stuff and they just speak about him in such a bad way. What's the deal with that difference in, in, in idea of, 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 of how people view him? I think the people, the highest tone level people that I meet who knew LOH say positive things about him. And the people low on the tone scale who knew LOH say bad things about him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if one wanders over to a group like uh, the Ex Scientology Message Board, it's just full of hatred. Uh, it's full of people attacking, trying to destroy, and nobody there is producing anything positive. It's all attack, attack, destroy, destroy. And a lot of them, they're just doing it to be part of a social club and feel important. Yeah. Uh, some of them have even said it to me. Oh, well, I don't know anything about Scientology, but oh, I just go along to the protest just because it's something to be part of and um, I feel like I'm doing something important. <laughs> Some of these low tone people are just ridiculous, but it's interesting how you brought up uh, Donald Trump earlier because that's what I noticed is really similar in them. In them, in that like people either like them or they hate them, and it's mm. like if you listen to people who hate Trump, they just speak to, about him as if he's a devil, and the people who love him speak to him about him as if he's like heaven or whatever. And it's so similar to LRH in that like people are just like strongly divided, and I and I think it really confuses. The average person because they're just like what the hell is going on and because the majority seem to be on the anti lih side people start to you know people seem to be thinking badly of him you know when it's not really true it's just nah mm. well most people who hear something about scientology don't actually look into it in any detail they believe what they hear on abc news or whatever um they just don't have a look at it sufficiently to find out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, They're so. just superficial. Well, even yeah. like, let's, let's say, look at the homosexuality thing, and LRH said um, some, some bad things about them, right? But also, in 1950, homosexuality was classified by psychiatry as a mental illness. It was also kind of illegal, and yeah. there's these extra things about it that they don't, that they don't, understand and if you don't have this extra information you, you just hear it and you think oh he, he's anti-gay and he's mean person but it's just like no that's not the case at all like you don't know you don't know the context and the history and all this sort of stuff mm. yeah, I mean I think things have gone um, I find this LBGT movement strange yeah it's gone yeah. too far yeah too far into accepting weird things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could just add on more things. Okay, let's add on sadomasochism. Let's all add on Bugger the Dog and the Cat. Let's, you know, are the animals consenting? Um, uh, they have dog brothels in Germany. Um, <laughs> dogs, horses, donkeys. Really? Hey, seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, not a lot of people get involved in these things, but. Uh, it just gets stranger and stranger, and then you get the idea of, well, should gay people um, be allowed to adopt children? Um, it's, a, it's an experiment. One can't say yes or no. There's not enough evidence in any way to determine whether children are better off or worse off from having two same-sex parents. Personally, I would say it needs to undergo a lot of study before approving it. I don't think it would just, you can't make that sort of change to the way society has been for hundreds of years and expect things to just carry on normally. Yeah. Children are going to be different if they have two male or two female parents. Their whole upbringing is going to be 
within the context of having homosexual parents. Well, yeah, and and speaking of these sort of unusual spiritual things, apparently the male and the female body have like opposite chakras that match up or something, and it's more natural. But people can be whatever they want to be, and you can grant people beingness, and that's fine. And and I think that that's what should happen with gays. I think they should be allowed to marry and stuff. But it's just like when it's you can tell when it's taken too far, and I think it's it's going too far. It's like it's just like leave little kids alone, let them be whatever they want to be. Don't encourage them to be gay and say you know you should be this. And it's just it's weird, you know. Things are going. It's it's something that's weird that's popular at the moment. That it's just. Uh, it's going too far, you know. And that's my feeling. Yeah. Mm. What 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 was what was your post uh, on the Apollo? Most of the time, I was looking after the radars, the radios, that sort of thing. An electronics technician. Uh, Mallory used to send me his e-meters to fix and look after. Um, so I was looking after all the e-meters on the ship. Um, I had the radars, the radios, anything electronic. I looked after it, photocopiers, the depth finder, um, a few other things. And what? Mm. And when? where was the ship during this time? Uh, we went through um, Morocco, Portugal, uh, Madeira, Los Palmas, Tenerife, uh, Madeira. We sailed over the Atlantic and went to... Uh, the Bahamas, there in Bermuda, um, then we were around the, the various islands, uh, Curacao, in the Puerto Plata, in the Dominican Republic. Well, we visited quite a few places. Can I ask an interesting question? Did you find Atlantis? Did I find it? Yeah. Did the Apollo find Atlantis? No. No? Uh, so I never heard anything about that mentioned on the ship, nor any evidence of it. All right. Anyway, it'll be, it'll be interesting if, <laughs> to find Atlantis, but anyway. Uh, there might have been several different Atlantises. Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. The oceans have changed. Uh, I mean, if you look out from the... If you go east of uh, the United Kingdom, there's a whole chunk of land there that had people living on it. And got submerged under the sea. And uh, England used to go across to uh, the main continent. And the sea levels have changed. So there might be a dozen different societies, civilizations that have been buried. And it's hard to say which one one could call Atlantis. Yeah. Um, what? Um, when did you do order training? Was it on the ship? Um, I did solo auditor training on the ship. I started solo auditing. <coughs> um, I trained as an auditor, first of all, on the RPF at Flag. I was on the RPF for six months. And then after I got off the RPF, I did formal training uh, with Class 4, Dianetics, HRD, and all that. And then I was... Uh, co-audit supervisor and doing review auditing for staff. Yeah. So start seventy from seventy eight onwards formal training. Yeah. And flag would have been a pretty um fun time there, so you saw it all getting set up and beginning and stuff? Um it wasn't really I would say it wasn't really fun for the people who first arrived there. Where <laughs> I moved over to Flag at uh, Daytona Beach which was quite a nice place. We were, took over a motel and delivering there. Uh, the Fort Harrison was in serious need of uh, renovation and uh, it was infested with cockroaches, rats, everything. So the people there the first couple of months cleaning it up, they had a rougher time of things. <clears throat> and uh, flag was nice. Um, you actually had proper beds to sleep in when I first went there. Um, but after a few years, it was all switched to bunk beds. So you might have nine staff in a room, all sleeping in bunk beds, one hotel room. 
Is this uh, is this actually in the Fort Harrison building? So they're ordered yeah. at, at at the bottom levels and up the top of levels. People would sleep. Um, people, a lot of the staff were sleeping in the Fort Harrison when I was there. Um, different buildings, the purposes switched, and generally the staff were moved into the least desirable accommodation, and the better rooms were sold for use by public or rented out to public. When did, when did the bedroom switch that you're talking about, when did you notice that? What year did that happen? Um, it didn't happen all at once. It was gradual. Um, I think I would say... Oh, 70... Late 70s, they started moving in the bunk beds. And you weren't really getting paid much or anything? It was just sort of a, uh, a volunteer thing because it was fun and, and doing what, what's right in that? It was about $25 a week then. $24, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then one had, didn't have to pay for auditing or training or nothing, so that was that was $24 on top of um, food accommodation, training, auditing, um, health care. Um, yeah. So it was actually probably a lot more than people on minimum wage had to take home with them after paying their basic expenses. What what sort of hours were you working? Um, well, I know we've had the horror stories, but uh, I would say I was working on average from nine to six with um, sort of 45 minutes for lunch um, and then I would have evenings for study. Yeah, so most of my time in the Sea Org was on that sort of schedule. Yeah. Maybe an hour long sometimes, but maybe eight thirty to six or something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, tell me about uh, when you left and and what sort of happened around about that time. Um, things were getting heavy. I left when. Um, the screaming, the heavy ethics, the uh, the working conditions started getting worse. Um, I had a comev which um, it would take too long to go into too much detail about, but at the end of it, I was debarred from advanced courses for eternity, um, mainly because I had given advanced course materials to some missionaries who were going to set up an advanced organization in Africa um, but apparently I gave them the materials before they'd received final authorization to fire on the mission. Um, I think I was on a hit list basically because um, hit lists started happening around 1980 and there were various people who were on these lists and excuses were found to get rid of them, to come out them, to put them in ethics, to get them busted. Why? Why do they want to do that? <clears throat> um, it started with the FEBC students. There was an FEB training course at FLAG. LOH had the idea that a lot of executives were ripping off the org, running private businesses, using staff for them, making profits. Um, and he thought they were all criminals. And so a huge FEBC program was arranged to bring replacements to flag for training and send the replacements back. Then they could bust these people and um, handle their out ethics. But then it also became that certain people got onto hit lists. I think it started soon about the time Bill Bill Franks was declared suppressive. And what um, year was that? This was, uh, I think it was 80, 81. It could have been 82. Yeah. I think 81. And I think I made a comment that I thought Bill Franks wasn't suppressive. He was a good guy. And uh, I think that got me on a hit list, and so uh, uh, 
a lot of people were busted for different things. And I think anything which anyone who was not in agreement with the um, the CMO takeover was busted. And this went on for years and years with Miscavige just busting everyone for anything. He was continually looking for counterintention to management. Um, yeah, it just it all seems like it just as soon as David Miscavige started to come into the picture and L H started to leave, that's when things started to go bad. You know, what I don't I mean? think it was just him. Um, I think a lot of people. I mean, this is a controversial point, perhaps, but this isn't true of the early CMO members. You know, the ones I knew on the ship, but a lot of the people who joined the CMO were ex-Nazis. <laughs> I I know, uh, what do you mean, like, what, you mean like reincarnated Nazis? I mean, I knew the guy who, they had their own um, auditing unit called the Cracker Jack unit. <laughs> uh, and the CMO all had sort of quite a lot of auditing, most of which were sack checks. But I knew the guy who ran it, and I knew the one of the auditors um, who was auditing them. And without going into individual case data, both independently said to me that most of the CMO believed that they were ex-Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they acted like it. And they enjoyed they were, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was their personality type. I mean, whether they were actually ex-Nazis or not, I don't know. But they certainly to have, seem to have this thing in common that they, they behaved like little Nazis. <laughs> and they went around kicking people out and, and changing things. And what's his yeah. face? Uh, Miscavige seems like a bit of a Nazi because around at that time he was in a CMO, wasn't he? Well, if you look at his photo and put it next to that of Joseph Goebbels... They do look quite similar to me. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say he was. I just, uh, but he certainly acts like a Nazi. Um, people who are part of the church, who might be listening to this, see, they'll be they'll be judging you the whole way through, going, oh, you know, is he is he this bad squirrel? Is he this SP or whatever? Um, so they'll be they'll be yeah scrutinising you. Um, but uh, when, when you're involved with the church, um, so you had many years of being a good church member, weren't you? And 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 you you got kicked out for something that 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 you weren't even in the wrong for. Is that right? Um, I would say, uh, yeah. Basically, it was an invented crime. Uh, I had no choice about handling over the advanced courses materials. I had. Um, Missionaries with mission orders. They said they need them. I gave them to them. Um, I think that they, they put me on the comab as some way of busting me. And basically, when they did that, I just said, "Well, I'm not having that. See you guys later." And looted out. Yeah, and it's like it's not just you. It's a lot of other people around about this time were getting declared when they shouldn't have been getting declared. Yeah, well, there were hundreds, thousands, I think thousands probably were declared at that time, yeah. Yeah. Um, when when did you go clear? Was it in the church? Um, yeah, I was uh, I tested clear in 19, <coughs> sorry, 1974. Oh, wow, pretty early on the thing, yeah. I the did ship. the, uh, yeah. I had to, I did the whole clearing course, solo auditors course, power R sixty W clearing course. Um, Do the grades and everything. Yeah, had about one hundred and fifty hours on the grades. One hundred and fifty hours. hours on the is that yeah. is and and you weren't CS by LRH or anything, no? no, no. But you you were CS though on the ship Apollo, which means you were at a pretty high standard tech place, right? I would say so, yeah. So would you say that then, then that's totally fine to do 150 hours on the grades then? That's actually a good thing? Um, I think 
I mean, I didn't get the best of auditors. I had a student auditor who was quite slow. I would say if I'd had a a good auditor, I could have got it done in half the time. And the way things were done then were quite laborious. Um, I felt a lot of things were overrun, the auditor missed EPs. Um, so while the general standard of tech was high, I had student auditors most of the time and they weren't that um, effective at getting the auditing delivered at a fast enough rate. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Cool, yeah. And so um I'll just with the clearing course and all that, do you think that's the standard route to do that before someone goes clear and everything or? Um, no, I think people mostly go clear on Dianetics, objectives, grades, whatever. I mean, I think I had the clearing, the clear cognition four times before doing the clearing course. Yeah. And when I look back over things, so yeah, if, if I'd been going through it now, I would have, um, I wouldn't have had to do the R6CW clearing course, etc. But I still got lots of gains out of it, so I wasn't unhappy about it. What What was it like to go clear? Um, if I describe it, I'd be describing the clear cognition. So, um, and there's a certain point one has with certain realization about certain things and. Uh, the nature of one's universe changes dramatically. Yeah. Sounds good, huh? Yeah. 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 Worth doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, so what about the, uh, the OT levels and that? You, did, you, did you do them on the ship and that sort of stuff in the late seventies and stuff, or what flag or? I did OT. I started OT two, OT three. I was on OT3 on the ship and then I was auditing OT3 uh, for some years I did about close to a thousand hours on OT3 at flag um, then I did the old OT4, 5, 6, 7 Sorry, is OT3 including solo auditing? OT3 is only solo auditing yeah. Okay, yeah it sounds like pretty your the auditing you've been getting is pretty thorough. Like it's it, there's no quicking going on. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I did. I spent thousands of hours on these things. Yeah. I mean, I've spent over five thousand hours on knots. Probably closer to ten thousand now. I just uh, I don't don't add it don't add it up anymore. Yeah, yeah. It seems like it's better. The only thing I notice is with um is when things bog down, you can sort of tell when they're bogging down. You know what I mean? And then that's bad. But obviously you shouldn't quickie, but you shouldn't bog down as well. Because I noticed that on objectives, um, I got bogged down on some things and it was kind of weird. There's a difference between a, a process that bites hard and it, you actually need to run for a long time and then actually bogging down. It almost bogging yeah. is almost a confusion. You're like, you don't even know what's going on. You just continue doing the same thing and... And uh, what what do you think of um, the solo knots taking really really long amount of time and um, sort of can you explain that in any sort of way? I think solo knots is really um, it's a lot of levels. It's handling a lot of layers of case. Um, I'd say it's at the moment at least ninety percent of the case gain in Scientology is solo knots. Really? I would say it's a very long level that needs to be done thoroughly. Is it, is it, is think, it, is it done just after OT3 or at OT7? Uh, it's, it's now done at uh, OT7. Yeah. Okay. And, how do, how, and is that how you do it in the independent field? Yeah. 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 Um... Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so, so it, t it takes a lot of hours, but um, 
So it's, I guess it's kind of like objective auditing in this SRD. Like it takes a long amount of time, but you get a lot, a lot of wins or something, do you? Yeah, I would say Solonox is, um, yeah, it's most of the case getting in Scientology at the moment. Mm. And everyone's cases are different, are they? So would, do you reckon LRH would be faster or could he even be longer than other people because he's gone through a lot of different stuff? I mean... I heard that LOH spent 1,500 hours on Mars. Um, that was one figure somebody told me. I can't check that. Um, it wasn't something I saw in writing. It was just a figure given to me. Um, so I'd say people, if somebody's spending less than 1,500 hours on Mars, then it's, it's too little. Yeah. Because I don't think anyone's going to do it faster than our age. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I would say I would expect a normal person to take five times, five times as long as our age. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's five times work. Just out of curiosity, do you think LRH passed away when the church said he passed away? The start of two th- eight, probably. 1986? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and some of this stuff that's really uh, out there that people might have heard on the O2 level is really uh, strange sort of stuff. Um, what do you say to that, to someone? Is it just... It's too... Is there any way you can explain to someone? Like... Well, it's... I would have to talk to the individual person. There's no way I could um, make an open statement about how to talk to them. I would have to talk to that person, find their reality level, and communicate to that one person. Because people have problems even <laughs> believing the prenatal thing. Some people can, especially people below um, tone two, can can get affected by just hearing the prenatal thing, and then they might hear something that's just really. It's too, it's too much for them to to understand and comprehend or something, and uh, they're almost better off not of hearing it, not have heard it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we're just talking mm-hmm. about the OT levels, and I, I want to say something about that because um, recently, actually, I read something on the OT levels, and I and I read it, and I was kind of like, oh, now I get why LH doesn't want you to read the OT levels, because after I read it. It it did it was too much for me to handle. I didn't have enough information um, to understand it properly, and um, it kind of made me feel like I I really questioned LRH. You know what I mean? Mm. I really questioned like you know was this guy you know a nutter or not basically, um, and then I had to I had to call up someone who I knew had read a similar thing. And I had to talk with him about it and get some more background data. And uh, I ended up sorting it out. And I was uh, I was okay with it. I'm still not totally. I still I just need more data. But I was handled a lot on it. But I was kind of like um, I understood that phenomenon of like sometimes you can hit information that's just you don't have enough data to understand it. Yeah. And, uh, and you can get thrown off by it. Um, and it's quite it's quite interesting. So some some people who might have heard negative stuff about Scientology and stuff that's that's out there, and, and a lot of these Scientology haters and stuff, and the people that put stuff on the internet might talk about some stuff that goes on in these OT levels, and uh, and you and people who are listening who who don't know much about Scientology, if they um they might be thrown off by it, but the thing is, it's I I think it's just you need more data. You need more information to explain it. Like, well, let's just use the prenatal thing for an example. It's like you might sound it sound like it's out there, or the past life thing. It might seem like it's out there, but for people who who actually have information about these sort of things, you know, and people who are a lot of funky spiritual people, and you know, to them it's not. And it's because they've got more data. So don't just dis- dismiss things as being, you know, out there and, and, and being bullshit because it's just like you need a lot of background information. What do you think? Yeah. And it's 
some of it is awareness level. There are a lot of people who just are going to take a lot of work to reach the point where they realize they're not just a piece of meat and they are a spiritual being. And the data is going to be much harder for them to accept. Uh, so they probably need a lot of auditing before before they reach the point of being ready to understand the OT level data. Yeah, and, 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 and I agree like that people should stay away from it. Only if somebody's really, really well read and, and really aware would I say, you know, you should be all right to read it. This is just what I think, you know, it might be wrong, but... Um, well, if but, you read History of Man, I mean, you're reading History of Man. Yeah, and yeah. That has- lot of data from the OT levels yeah, on it. Exactly, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 yeah, exactly. I'm going to say that now. If anyone wants to just to just know what's in the OT levels, just go and read History of Man. That that, that, that covers so much. That covers so much. That book. Um, that's enough. That's that's it's all you need. Too that's yeah. all. You, that's really, really all you need. Um, and but and and some of these people, like you get some, like I don't know, some 21 year old from the suburbs or something. You know, if they just hit some of, some of this sort of information in Scientology, like, it can really put them off it. So, and some people who are lower on the bridge, so it's just like, you know, certain people, I think, can sort of handle it, but other people, yeah, definitely, no, nah, it, can, it can ruin Scientology for you, so you just stay away from it. And, yeah, all the information's in the history of man, you know, because I, um, yeah, I read that I've recently. I've seen how society is. Uh, the level, general... Um, Sorry, I've got an update thing coming up here. Uh, okay, it's gone. Um, the general education level of the society has gone down. Oh, yeah. So That's, bad. I mean, now kids learn from videos. They can't read. They can't, yeah. They actually can't, yeah. Kids can't read instruction books. Yeah. They have to go on that and watch a video of someone explaining, you know, how to put a new bag in their vacuum cleaner or, you know... Um, how to uh, boil an egg, how to, um, there are videos on that, how to chop up carrots. Um, all these things have videos explaining them. Well, this is part of the uh, whole dwindling spiral thing because it's like, I, I, I know because I'm part of the generation and, I, can, and I, I experienced the transformation of actually learning how to speak and read English, right? And that's why hitting LRH, LRH's data and the information about word clearing was so revolutionary for me because it was like, whoa, you know. Because our, my my grandparents' generation, right, they could actually read and sort of duplicate things more and they could read LRH's books and understand. But if you take an 18-year-old kid now and give him a Dianetics book, he's just going to struggle to read it. He's going to absolutely struggle. And it's just like... The, and the school systems are just, I mean, not, I don't want to get all negative, but it's just like they, they literally don't teach kids how to read. They actually don't. And all you, can, all you can do is have a conversation with them, but they can't actually study formal stuff like a university or Scientology materials. They actually can't read them and duplicate them because they just, they're full of MUs. They're, just, they're not told what words mean. They're not, they're not, they don't learn it. What I, what I noticed... Um, a lot of people seem to learn the language not by understanding the words anymore. They talk in phrases. Like somebody would say, oh, I know what you mean. But they don't know what the words I know what you mean each mean. They just know the phrase. Um, I've got to go to work. They might not know all the words in the, sen- in the phrase or the sentence. But somebody said, I've got to go to work. They got the idea of what it means and they don't understand the words in it. They just know that's the phrase, that's the sentence to say when you're going to work. And there's a lot of people in the society at that level of just not understanding the words. And they have a vocabulary of phrases. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. And, and, and it's not just... It's not just words like go or even I. Yeah, they're not even really aware of what words like I or me and, and these. It's just, just the schools aren't teaching people how to read. They literally aren't. And that's why some kids can go to university and they'll open up this thing with all these fancy, ridiculous words that's written in like a complex sentence way. 
and they struggle with it and they end up just not really enjoying university and leaving and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, that's a big thing, huh? Terrible thing. Mm. Mm. And just the the whole idea of um, it's put forward that different people have different ways of learning, and lots of people learn by video better than by reading. And I would say that um, while it's easier to teach people with videos if you don't have to teach them how to read and write, but reading and writing are necessary skills, and everyone should be able to learn that way in order to make it in the world. Or yeah. flip burgers. <laughs> the, the, and, and, yeah, the kids are just, the way the school systems are, they're just wasting all this time not even learning the basics. And that's why it's like it's kind of difficult for people who are trying to promote Scientology in that because we've got these materials that are written in the 50s when people could actually understand words and duplicate written materials. And you, you hand it to some 18-year-old kid and it's like good luck having them trying to understand what the hell's going on with this. You know, like it all starts with the MU thing. You know, more than anything, that's the, that seems to be the most important thing. But then the other thing is, if one if one accepts the idea of reincarnation, then one has a lot of a lot of the children being born just have no experience for a long time. They've never had bodies on this planet before, so, or at least not recently. Mm. We're dealing with much more um, inexperienced theta beings interesting yeah so they're not used to the English language and that so that they're, they're going to be having more problems with it yeah 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 alright so um, we're coming towards the end of the the podcast and um, what so basically you left the church in the early 80s right yeah 82 and um, a lot of people left at that time. And so since then, have you been doing um, privately auditing people? Is that basically what you've been doing as a job or what? Uh, well, I left in 82. Um, I got a job working with British Telecom for a couple of years, computer programming. Uh, then I started some freelance work um, programming. Uh but at the same time, I was auditing people. I started auditing people in the evenings, uh, helping people with things, courses. Um, so it was quite a few years before I actually started um, doing auditing all the time and gave up the full-time employment. It was maybe 10 years or so. Mm. So are the other are independent people contacted you and, and were happy to get audited by you back in those days? <laughs> Yeah, back in, starting in 1980, um, what was it, 84, yeah. There were other people who had left and they, they didn't want to be involved with the church in that? A lot of people left in 82 and 83. Yeah. Thousands. Um, yeah. It doesn't appear in, appear in the history books written by the church, but there were thousands. Yeah, 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 yeah. And quite highly trained as well. Mm. Yeah, and... Um, How's the independent field going these days, do you think? Uh, it's sort of muddling along. It's uh, it's not really expanding at a huge rate. It's, um, it's um, I don't see growth, except maybe, I think in Taiwan they have. Yeah, I heard that, yeah, I heard, yeah. Did you hear 100 staff? I heard 100 staff. I heard that number. I yeah. I haven't seen it personally, but that sounds wow. Because I think what? Because hmm. I I know that the church was busy. Like I actually know because I spoke to because there's a lot of Taiwan people in Melbourne when I was involved with the church, and so that the Taiwan churches and and that um were actually busy, like like what were things were like back in the seventies, and so I imagine that yeah they 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 probably do have an independent mission or something, independent org that's uh, got a hundred staff or something. The yeah. Taiwanese people love it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll be there next lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I think I will as well. It sounds like a pretty good uh, country anyway, outside of that. Yeah. Like things that, except real estate's real expensive apparently. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 
I've got a while to go, I think, this lifetime, so yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll look at it in 20 years and see. <laughs> What's uh, Make so, up my mind. Yeah, and, and what, do, what do you think of these uh, above, like the OT8 and above that and that sort of stuff and, and how do you get your hands on them? What do you, what do you think of those levels? Um, I think OT8, I mean, there's been so many different versions of OT8. Um, I don't really think there are more than a handful of people ready to do them. Um, I think people mostly need to do a lot more auditing on solo knots. Um, I mean, all these people who are releasing OT levels up to OT42, I just think it's delusory. It's not OT levels. It's something else. Did LRH even get up to OT8? <laughs> yeah. Um, I can only go on what David Mayo has said that LOH was solo auditing on a few levels above OT8. Um, he did talk in various places about research on levels up to OT22. Um, but it, it can be a matter of how one numbers things. One could take eight levels and package them all as one OT level, or one could number them OT8 to 16. Yeah. Um, I think really we have to get a lot more people finished through solo knots doing OT8 and then look more into OT9 and do the ideas that some of us have about how they will run work for most people. Yeah. I mean, I, I have my own ideas about OT9, which I've changed a lot over the years. Um, now I have a particular idea of what's involved in it but there's very few people i could talk to about how to run it yeah because um, i have so little experience doing it with other people yeah um and you're talking about you get how there's these this you may handle a lot of charge on a solo knots or something um mm -hmm. well, let's say let's say with objectives right so you can do a process and you you're less keyed in right and hmm. you, you can you can be smarter or more aware what sort of wins do you get from solo knots i suppose one gets lighter um the heaviness of the body disappears uh one's space expands one feels much bigger one's intention increases um, and then sort of what Warren call OT level, OT abilities start popping up. Um, I mean, some, uh, sometimes I can see other people's cases and just boom, forward it, it without talking to them about it and just boom, boom. All right, we're going to, I decide to handle this and it handles. It's not oh, something I generally do. It's something I would consider to using in an emergency if a person's extremely ill or they have some heavy condition then i can audit it directly if and it you, works with some people sometimes if if you were past someone walking on the street or something could you suddenly as is something on their case and key them out um yeah so, i won't say i can do it with everyone i can say i can do it with some of the people some of the time do you do it to just amuse yourself and and because it's good to do and Oh, just something to do. Some, I mean, something. Um, uh, yeah, it's a useful thing to do. It's not something I do a lot because it's basically overriding their self determinism. Oh, okay. So yeah. If somebody's gets their case pulled apart on an other determined basis, they're not going to really get long term benefits from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, I do see how it would be a good thing to get everyone up to OT7 and then just, just be keying everyone out. Just key mm -hmm. everything, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's certain processes I can give to people who've done OT8 and are ready for OT9 that, yeah, they can key people out around them and walk into a room and the room gets brighter. The people get brighter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, between, because apparently LRH contacted David Mayo in 82 or something and sort of told him to leave the church or whatever 
what do you think? No. What do you What do you think of that? I've never heard that from anyone. Well, I, well, I heard that David Mayo said um, that LIH LIH said he's losing control of the church, and you you might have to start something up outside of the church. I didn't hear that from David Mayo or anyone else. Wow, yeah, no, I've heard David Mayo say that, like in one of his lectures or something, or some interview, he, he said that. I'd have to listen to it. I don't recall. I mean, there's a lot of David Mayo's tapes I didn't listen to, so it's possible he said it at some point. Yeah. So so what do you, do you, do you like David Mayo and his tech and, and what he did? And, uh, yeah, what do you think of that? Um... I like David Mayo. He was CSing me for a lot of time when I was on OT3. Um, after he left the church, he was doing good things. He was delivering the tech. Um, he was a very... Uh, he was a good person. He had integrity. Uh, he didn't like the heaviness that was going on in the church. Um, now I think David Mayo has drifted away from the tech. He's not really doing, he's not active um, and hasn't been for quite some time. Um, so I think basically he was, um, he couldn't really handle the independent scene. He was just had too many attacks on him. And, um, there were too many suppressive assholes trying to do him in and he just didn't want to have nothing to do with it anymore yeah and uh between 83 when when things started really going bad like in 82 and stuff uh what do you think lih was doing at that actual time do you just think he was writing a lot of mission earth uh lih was hiding um he had a lot of problems with the um the ios taxes he was in constant fear of um, being found and arrested. Um, so, yeah, he was involved with Scientology, but he wasn't very much involved with the day-to-day -day management. Yeah, and do you think he was just... Do you think he was being productive, or do you think he was um, on his deathbed sort of uh, s struggling to survive or something like, you know... I think he was productive until not long before he died. So do you think so? So you don't think it was a gradual deterioration of his health? It was more of a sort of sudden, sort of. I don't really have enough data to say. I can just I can speculate, but I wasn't there, and I'd already left quite a while before, so I'd just be speculating, really. Well, I've I've listened to Mission Earth, and and if the last book on Mission Earth is one of the last things he completed, um, that person, whoever wrote that you know which is most likely him because it's so intelligent and it, and it, and it it doesn't seem like it it shows the signs of someone whose intelligence is deteriorating or they're getting whatever it is the old people get where their memory goes or they get worse it didn't show any signs of that it showed signs of someone who was still switched on still intelligent and uh yeah you know that's my feeling he was i think he was active and um, in command of his senses until close to the end. But that's my speculation. I don't have evidence. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, if anyone wants to get audited by you or wants to read some of the in interesting information you've got on, on your website, uh, what can they look up? What, what's, what's it called? Um, oh, they could just look up my name on Facebook. It's probably the easiest. Um, I've got... Um, www.ralphhilton.eu website there um, but the easiest way is um, just to look me up on Facebook and say hi yep and and uh, you can help can you get help get someone from uh, like objectives all the way up to the OT levels and stuff yeah objectives they'd have to either find someone locally or come here um, so TRs objectives um We'll have to work something out on, but yeah, I can work with people, um, all the levels of the bridge. And people can uh, go there to buy this e-meter as well? Yep. Wow. The e-meter is really impressive, I reckon.
Like, I have those extra abilities, it's just like, it saves so much time fiddling around with knobs and... Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks for being on the podcast, Ralph, and... Um, okay. Yeah, I'll speak to you sometime in the future. Okay. Thanks a lot. That's See ya. Okay.